Namaste to my viewers. Uh, my guest today is Dr. Ravi Ravindra, uh, a dear friend. Uh, Ravi, I don't know. Uh, get, welcome to my show, Ravi. Uh, great Thank to you very much, Ravi. Yeah. After how we many... haven't really met each other now for many years. When was I, when was the last time we met? When was the last time we met? Oh, I think probably ten years ago, maybe. Maybe more. Maybe more even. I came to Princeton to to your place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember the, all that. I remember. I remember exactly the room where we sat, what we talked about. But that was like ten, fifteen years ago. That's right. So, maybe fifteen years ago. So yeah. when was the when was that uh, famous Templeton board meeting in Princeton Hyatt Regency when I was invited as a guest? Yes. Ah. Uh, you were that you, was, you were on the you were on the advisory board. What year was that? I have been on their advisory board actually in the late nineties, but again in I was a judge for about three years on their award, and then I at that time was not on the advisory board. But then I came back again on the advisory. Board. No, no. But when we met was the first time you were on the advisory board. That's when Herb Benson was there. All these famous people they brought in the Hyatt Regency <laughs> Hotel in uh, Princeton. What year was that? I am guessing must have been ninety-eight. Yeah, it was ninety-eight. Ninety-eight, like, and you had just introduced this book, which we will talk about, Christ the Yogi. <laughs> That's right. This because, <laughs> because this book in the beginning says ninety-eight. Yes. So yeah. it may be that was soon after that. It was around about yeah. that time. So, uh, so to my viewers, I want to uh, I want to say that uh, Ravi is a philosopher. Physicist, a philosopher of science. This is just my characterization, so I hope you uh, you can tell if you agree or not. He's a he's a physicist by training, philosopher by training, a philosopher of science and religion, and exceedingly exceedingly well read Christian theologian uh, and a Hindu. Yeah. So he knows physics, he knows philosophy, he knows Christianity, and he knows Hinduism. Have I missed anything, uh, Ravi? <laughs> well, <laughs> really, in a way, one begins to realize how little one actually knows. Yeah, but in terms of, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'm discussing with the uh, Ravi, the public figure and author. Uh, so, well. <laughs> so in terms of your impact on the world, it's in these domains. So, I, uh, uh, I want to uh, uh, basically discuss several things because this covers a lot of space and those of my viewers who are serious people who are into this space of understanding you know uh, science and Vedic science and Christianity and how Christianity and Hinduism are related uh, how science is related to these religions uh, all of that that's the topic which we are going to talk about okay so, uh, and he's a very serious person, has written a lot, lot of books. How many books have you written, uh, uh, Ravi? Must be so many. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> or maybe 12 or 13 okay. or something like that. Okay. I haven't counted it. <laughs> so, I'm going to, uh, if the camera could zoom in on this, I'm going to uh, start by discussing this book because it's a very uh, important uh, book that uh, uh, Ravi wrote called Christ the Yogi. And while it has become more for f familiar and more sort of fashionable now to, to, for, for people to discuss Christ as a yogi and the whole movement of Christian yoga has also uh, joined, uh, jumped off of this, Ravi's book is one of the first. And uh, let, me, let me say a minute, a, a couple of remarks about that book. Yes. That book was initially published in England for the first time in 1990 okay. under the title Yoga of the Christ. Okay. Okay. And then it was translated into many languages. Yes. And in some countries, they were not happy to have that title in which the word yoga and Christ came together. Correct. For example, in Greece, as an example, the book was translated into Greek, into French, German, Portuguese, Spanish, many, many languages. But the, the publisher in Greece actually wrote me a letter saying if the word yoga and Christ are in the same 
context, the church will burn his publishing house down. Right. So they changed the title. Right. Same thing happened. They changed the title to something like symbolism in the Gospel of John. Right, right, right. So same thing happened in USA. In UK. In the USA. No, in the UK it was published under the Yoga of the Christ. Okay. And USA? But in the USA, they changed the title to Christ the Yogi. Okay. And which was not the point I was actually trying to make. Right. I use the word yoga as a way of saying the path according to Christ or the teaching of Christ. Correct. Correct. And, okay. And then because I objected to this publisher using this title, they said when they sell out the present numbers of copies, then they change the title again. Right. Now the new title this might actually interest you. The new title is this, The Gospel of John in the Light of Indian Mysticism. Okay. And because then that sounds very academic. And because, because of that, the U American Catholic Theological Association, which has 1,500 theologians as members of it, they actually had a special session on this book. When was that? In one what of what the, was the year? One of the, that session was, I think, in 2000. Um, well, I can tell you when this book was published. It was the year after that. Uh, I think 2006 or seven. Okay. I think in 2006 is my vague memory. Okay. They had a special session on this. Okay. So, by your banner, ladies and gentlemen, you are in for a real treat. This is the real stuff. This is a lot of stuff I've, I've talked about, written about. So we have a very important person uh, who will, uh, I will go through a series of questions. Now, when I looked at this book, uh, it's very interesting that chapter by chapter uh, picks up specific things in the life of Jesus and specific things mentioned in the Bible and gives a kind of a Hindu uh, dharmic, yogic, whatever you want to say, Vedantic, uh, you know, input, how to, how to make sense of it from a Vedantic point of view. Uh, in other words, there is, a, there is something about conflict between spirit and world, uh, the bread, the concept of the bread, the uh, struggle between the self and the ego, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, this uh, whole the kingdom of heaven stuff, uh, the whole concept of the sheep and the shepherd, uh, uh, so all of the, 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 the blindness is natural, adultery, mixing of levels. So he is taking uh, 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 the work of the father, uh, the scandal on the, the whole idea of the cross, all the terms, metaphors, ideas, major ones that comprise the doctrine of Christianity. He has taken them one by one in separate chapters and rationalized them, explained them from a Vedantic point of view. And here is a, for example, a very interesting, uh, uh, on page 103, there is a diagram, there is a diagram which talks about uh, the, the uh, father, the son. And the interesting thing in this diagram is that there is a descent from above, down, which is God, down, and ascent from man, ascent from man. Uh, so this, this is... Uh, the, the ascent of the aspiration of the man. So this is sort of like the our idea in the in the, in the Hindu dharma, the idea of a rishi, or somebody who aspires and evolves the consciousness and goes higher and higher. Now this is a very interesting book, and the reason that Catholic Church called uh, you know which has uh, 1,500 theologians, uh, they called a special meeting to discuss this, is because it's a very important book. Uh, now, from the Christian point of view, it's an important book because it informs them of uh, Vedanta, educates them about Vedanta, about the resources in the Vedanta, uh, about what they can accept, what they can reject, uh, uh, how they can have dialogue with Hindus uh, and all of that. So I think uh, I would say that your work, Ravi, has been a milestone in the, uh, uh, in the evolution of Christianity, Christian thought nowadays. I would say that you've had a very profound impact on the evolution of Christian theology uh, in the light of uh, the Vedantic challenge? Well, maybe this will be of interest to the listeners 
that I have received and I still continue to receive emails these days. Earlier, it would have been letters written by Christian priests, ministers, even Christian monks who have been very touched by this. A cardinal in the Vatican, Cardinal Echigaray, who read this in French, he wrote to me. And the, the Bishop of London, who officiates on all the royal weddings, etc. It's a very important position. He actually wrote to me, saying, this was 1991, he wrote, saying, I have been teaching from this gospel for the last 20 years. This came as a breath of fresh air. Then he said, although I don't agree with everything you say, which is, of course, quite right. Why should he? But in a way, what I'm saying is that many, many people in the Christian context educated theologians. In fact, Houston Smith, whose name I'm sure is well known to anybody studying religion, he called it landmark in interfaith dialogue in a review. And um, then Wilford Cantwell Smith, who was the founding director of the Center for the Study of World Religions at Harvard. Yes. He actually wrote me a letter saying occasionally he had to wipe his tears reading this book. But then he also said something which was very interesting. He said, but you have undone half of my life's work. Yes. Because one of the points he tried to make in his educational context was that if we want to understand Islam, must hire an Islamic scholar. Similarly, if you want to understand Hinduism, you must hire a Hindu scholar. So at Harvard, they actually tried to do this because of his input. Then he said, now I realize that you don't really need to be a Christian by background to understand what Christ is saying. This is Wilfred Cantwell Smith who yeah. said that. So to my listeners, please keep listening carefully. It's going to be a long discussion because it's so serious. But where we are going to go will bring a lot of insight to you consistent with my works. So what I want my viewers to know is that there has been what, I, what you would say conventional Christianity, conventional Christianity uh, as interpreted by the church for its entire history till very recent times. Uh, and now there has been a sudden shake up because a few uh, pioneers like Ravi have brought to them to, and educated them in a very logical scientific way. Uh, the Vedantic perspective of cosmology, of the self, of the nature of the uh, you know, universe and all these ideas from a Vedantic point of view. And while some uh, Orthodox Christians resisted because they felt threatened and, they, and as he said, they did not want uh, yoga mixed in because it was too Hindu and so on. We are talking 25 years ago. Now things have changed. Uh, many of the prominent theologians and academic scholars of Christianity saw Ravi as a tremendous gold mine of ideas to help them rethink Christianity, reinvent, rehabilitate Christianity. This is why I think this interview is going to be a very important one. So I want people to uh, pay attention to it. So Ravi, uh, I am not surprised that Templeton would want you on their advisory board because you bring a perspective that within Christianity they haven't had. And so they want to have an outsider that they are, is logical, scientific, that they can understand and then they can, uh, they can then, you know, churn these ideas internally also with your help. So uh, I want to ask you that there is a difference between what I'm going to call conventional Christianity and a new kind of Christianity being created or invented or reimagined, which is scientific and with the help of Vedanta, two, two kinds of Christianity. And you have helped in developing the latter. Now, uh, in the church itself, the dominant number of churches, not all, but dominant number of churches and dominant number of people who are conventional Christians still believe the earlier interpretation of Bible which they've had for a long time. Would you agree that the, the voice that you represent of uh, how to interpret Christianity 
is a minority and uh, even though it's been 30 years or 25 years you've been doing this, uh, the scholars, the Christian theologians who are, uh, who are impressed and who are in, uh, uh, kind of incorporating your ideas into new kind of Christian theology are still a small number. Is that true? There are, there are actually two or three relevant points that I should make here. Yeah. There is actually, if you, I was aware of this in the late 1960s, in fact, starting in the middle of the 60s. I came to Canada in 1961. We were trying in 1963, trying to organize a symposium on different aspects of religion. Although I was studying physics, but from my point of view, I don't see any contradiction in search for truth. Whereas generally in the Western world, particularly religion and science have been at odds with each other. So I, with a few friends, we were trying to start a really a symposium on different aspects of religion in 1963. And some very distinguished people actually spoke in that symposium. It's people like Marshall McLuhan, as an example, or Northrop Fry, or um, several very famous Jewish rabbis spoke there, but nobody would agree to speak about mysticism. Because that, although there have been great Christian mystics, but mysticism was sort of set aside because mystical experience by nature is an experience which is not mediated by the mind, therefore by the church or by the scriptures. And so the mystics have always been in trouble in Christianity. And actually, until more or less the end of 1960s, even the biblically oriented bookstores had hardly any books on Christian mysticism. Right. But starting in the early 70s, there were flood of books on Christian mystics because there is a famous book by a Harvard theologian called Harvey Cox. And that title itself conveys the reason for that shift. The title of that book is Turning East. That was the time when several people, often carried on by LSD and this and that, they were going to India right. at that time. Even people like who became Ram Das later on, and people like Houston Smith and Wilford Cantwell Smith actually had done his PhD in India. And so what I'm saying is, that that shift that took place actually has much to do with the connection with a different perspective on religion, which people made more and more that connection after they started traveling to India. So that's one aspect. Second aspect is this. We need to be very careful. This is true really in Hinduism as well. We need to be very careful about spiritual practice and religion. Religions have a different enterprise. They are not really interested in creating spiritual searchers. Their whole enterprise is, is like they are good museum keepers at best. They can keep nice icons or even some standard books, etc. But something they don't like gets left out. For example, in the Christian tradition, there is a whole series of books, gospels really, written by also by the disciples of Christ, which were discovered only starting in 1949, surprisingly. Yes, because I'm, familiar, they were I'm familiar with that. Yes. Out, these are so-called Gnostic Gospels. Right. I'm and many of them are much closer to the Indian point of view. Right. In fact, right. many, many of them. Yeah. So I'm, I'm familiar with this. I, I, and I think it's very important for our viewers to understand the, especially the role of the 1960s New Age movement, uh, the so-called hippies, the gurus who came, the early gurus who came and many Americans out of disillusionment with their own culture, the counterculture people, they went to India, they brought many of these things back. Some of them became Harvard professors, uh, some of them uh, became uh, just luminaries in general in terms of uh, bringing not only into Christianity but also into Judaism. Yes. Uh, they brought new ideas and actually I'm writing a book on the, uh, the how the 60s revolutionized Judeo-Christianity. 
Yes. I'm writing it. No, book. I think it is important to realize that the, what the churches do. You see, we have, I think, one very important distinction in India, which actually is not there in in any of the Abrahamic religions. And that is, in India, if you wish to get some spiritual wisdom, you can find try to find a guru, a wise person, but not necessarily a priest. Whereas in Christianity, if you want any spiritual wisdom, you end up going to a priest. Right. And, but in India, there is a distinction. Right. <laughs> the priests, of course, have their function. Right. And for any ceremonial purposes at like weddings or funerals, we naturally invite the priests. Right. But if you wish to have spiritual wisdom, you don't necessarily go to the priest. Right. So actually in India, there has been a great distinction between the two. Right. And in fact, when we look back, any of our great sages, let us say in the 20th century, Raman Maharishi, Aurobindo, Krishnamurti, well, really, even Vivekananda, he died in 1901, supposing we included him in 20th century. They were hardly priests, none of them. That's not their function. Yeah. So, so, let's, so let's, let's, let's not go all over the place. I have a certain flow. I want to have the conversation with you in a certain se sequence, because otherwise we'll just go all over the place. But I will cover all these things. I want to, towards yeah. the end, talk about Agama. I want to talk about the, the Hindu idea of Agama. When we come back, uh, okay, because I, I feel that the priest also has been misunderstood as somebody just doing mumbo jumbo, and we need to make uh, uh, re understand and appreciate what the priest is doing in the light of Agama, which I don't think Christianity has something equivalent to that. But we'll come to that systematically. I just want to go uh, one point at a time. So, uh, okay. so the the old. Uh, conventional Christianity, which has dominated for most of its history until very recent decades, and even now dominates the majority of the church and majority of the Christians. I have a feel. I would say that modern science, which has been fighting with this Christianity for a long time, discovered in Vedanta, discovered in Hinduism in the 1960s, a way forward where they could. They could try the experiment, they could start an experiment to try and use Vedanta as a glue, as a bridge between science on one side and Christianity on the other side. And you played an important role in helping the reconciliation of science and Christianity. Would you say that's fair? Yes. <laughs> In a way, one could say that the Templeton Foundation ends up spending much of its time and energy on that. And I fully Whenever agree with you. And I fully agree with you. Templeton Foundation's uh, whole mission, the multi-billion dollar enterprise, the whole mission uh, under the canopy of science and religion is really reconciling Judaic Christianity and science. Uh, data mining the Vedanta. They are data mining the Vedanta. Uh, for ideas, for symbolism, and seeing, okay, which of these can fit into Bible? Uh, can we make Mary a goddess? They're trying, but it didn't work. Can we, uh, you know, can we, can we reinterpret, can we interpret Gospel of John as Vedanta, uh, which Ramakrishna Mission also helped them do, and you are helping, you are taking it, you are taking what Ramakrishna Mission started doing some decades ago, uh, in reinterpreting, uh, uh, you know, uh, various uh, parts of the Bible in a Vedantic way, you have made it more scientific. You have made it more, much more scientific because you have a physics background uh, and helped uh, move this forward. And this propulsion of Vedanta as a new kind of science that can be of great value to Christianity to reinterpret itself uh, actually has been one of the reasons for starting the Templeton Foundation. Because even when I talked to Sir John Templeton, when he was still alive, he, he was quite openly, he was admitting it, not, it was never in their published works, but private conversations during coffee breaks and all, he would say that uh, uh, what the, what he called Eastern traditions are doing uh, in, in helping rehabilitate uh, Western religion is absolutely uh, amazing. And, and so he was putting his life savings, being a billionaire, into this project of uh, a Templeton Foundation. And, and uh, uh, so, so I just want to continue moving on this. Now, how 
the, the, the crisis of Christianity earlier is different than the crisis today. The crisis of Christianity until the 60s was that, you know, the evidence for science is becoming more and more. People don't, people aren't be talked out of science. This business of Christianity opposing science is a losing battle. Uh, the crisis was how to, how to bring science into Christianity. So, uh, you played a role in helping that and Templeton played a very big role. They, you, you worked for them and they also uh, are helping. Now, there is a different crisis. The different crisis is once they have digested enough of Vedanta into the Bible, now it creates a what let us call it new Christianity, a, Veda, a Hinduized Christianity, a Hinduized Jesus. Now, this is unacceptable to the orthodoxy within Christianity because what you have done is, see, I describe the orthodox conventional Christianity as history centric, which means that there are non-negotiable, non-repeatable uh, absolutes, historical absolutes like uh, original sin uh, causes eternal damnation and then to solve eternal damnation, God sends his one and only son and because his one and only child, there is no daughter, there is only son, it cannot be reproduced, no other, no, nobody else can claim and say, okay, you know, Krishna was also like that or Muhammad was like that because there is only one. Uh, so, this happens and uh, in order to uh, make Jesus not suffer from sin because all the progeny of Adam and Eve are cursed and they are born sinners. But for Jesus to do his job, he himself cannot be born as a sinner. So, he cannot be the progeny of Adam and Eve. Therefore, the virgin birth has to be important because virgin birth means he is not a progeny of Adam and Eve. He is born of a, without, a, without a sexual intercourse. So, he is not, he does not have that sin in him. A sexual intercourse is the transmission of sin uh, because it is the progeny of Adam and Eve. So, so, therefore, the virgin birth becomes important. And therefore, and then this, this whole business of uh, atonement at the cross uh, uh, and uh, uh, this whole business of, uh, uh, you know, being, uh, being persecuted at the cross and the resurrection from the cross, uh, this, is, this is sort of uh, uh, the Nicene Creed. I have just outlaid what they call the Nicene Creed. Uh, this, is the, this is the sort of non-negotiable history-centric definition of Christianity all these years. And now, in the interest of making Christianity scientific, using Vedanta as the, as the tool, uh, they have created this what, let us call it Templeton Christianity for our conversation. Okay, let us call it Templeton Christianity and of course, it is also Ken Wilber's Christianity, it is also Herb Benson's Christianity, it is also uh, Christianity of uh, Henry Stapp, uh, all kind of people's Christianity. Uh, they are all uh, different uh, 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 suction mechanisms to take different aspects of Vedanta in. Uh, the, the new Templeton Christianity, uh, in order to be scientific compliant, has created a second crisis. And this is the crisis of how do you now reconcile the Nicene Creed? Uh, how, how, do you, how do you do some gymnastics to, to make sense of all those things? All those things from Moses parted the ocean. Uh, to uh, you know, virgin birth, to uh, the uh, the kingdom, uh, the, this whole uh, uh, Eden where they do some thing wrong and they are, there is original damnation and all of that is pre is required preface to uh, those are the required conditions for Jesus to come and start what he started. So this historicity, this historical absolutes, historical non-negotiables and non-reproducibles are the def have been the definition, and so if you accept the Templeton Christianity, which is really Vedanta Christianity, uh, then all of that old stuff crumbles. And if that crumbles, then the whole power of the church, the institution goes away. So, tell me, now tell me, what do you think of this new crisis? This new crisis, you have, you have helped create and I am happy and it is good, you have you've, uh, played this role and you've, uh, you and Templeton and others have helped create this new kind of Christianity, which while it is gaining a lot of momentum uh, as a new Christianity, also has this tension with the old Christianity. So, tell us about it. Well, you know, my impression is that the church for the last almost 2000 years has been fairly clever. They, they can always 
find some way of emphasizing, for example, you emphasize belief, you have to have faith. And because that is said in the Bible. And of course, what is the Bible? Only the parts that have been selected to be in the Bible. After all, the canon has been established by destroying many other things. So in a way, what I'm saying that within the, what we may say within the Christian world or in the world where Christianity has been dominant, there have always been very great mystics, very wise people who don't take any of this literally. For example, although they often get into trouble with the church, that's a different matter. For example, Meister Eckhart will be a no, very no, big but, example. But, but that is the point. That is the point. See, in Christianity, they've had mystics, no doubt. And we can go through John of the Cross, Meister Eckhart. Two points. One is they have been isolated instances and not part, not product of a systematic training or systematic parampara or a systematic yogic process which is documented, which is validated, which is reproduced like say Patanjali and Kashmir Shaivism. So one is that they have been sporadic here and there but not part of a systemic preparation. That is one big difference with Hinduism because in Hinduism it is not that there is some random freakish uh, person, maybe because of his past life he has these experiences, but he is part of a, a guru parampara where he is trained to achieve these things. Second, second difference is that the established authority in Christianity never tolerated these things and they got rid of them because they were seen as a threat. So, institutional Christianity, official Christianity and Christianity is a very organized religion, it is not a, a dharmic type of uh, spontaneous thing. So, being a very institutionalized, organized, corporatized religion, you have to define what Christianity is as per how the Christians have defined it most of the time. So, uh, while they have had sporadic mystic here and there, which I fully agree, uh, the, the, the point is that uh, conventional Christianity and I am going back to that again, conventional Christianity for even though they may have had one or two some random people here in their own history and they could re rehabilitate them, bring them back after having persecuted them for all those centuries, persecuted those guys. They can now say, basically what you are describing is that young people start going to the new age movement and all, they start going to Hinduism and the church wants them back. So church says, why don't we look for similar things in our own history and revive them. But we persecuted these guys all these centuries, but we will forget the persecution. We will claim that that is the real Christianity just to get these guys back. So that we don't lose them to the enemy. So in a sense, in a sense, unless the institutional power structure of Christianity itself is demolished, which Templeton is not helping do. Templeton are not wanting to do that. They want to play both sides. Unless the institutional ambitions, power structure of the church is demolished. The any, any discussion about uh, becoming more scientific with the help of Vedas, Vedic knowledge, and uh, uh, showing that they had similar mystics of their own is fraught with risk. Because, because you know, Ravi, in the previous history of Christianity, they also digested pagans. Yes. They, they took, they, the pagans were a threat. So they took the yes. aspect, they did cut and paste selectively what they needed, they took. They, they baptized it into Christmas tree, Easter, mother, child, all of that. So many things that became part of Christianity standard uh, started were not Christianity. They were part of the enemy faith. The enemy was in those days pagan. They wanted to Christianize them. So they took aspects of these people and reinterpreted them into Christianity the way you are in reinterpreting Vedanta. So this was a device for them to what I call digestion. Digestion is a system of domestication. So, this particular uh, plant is dangerous or this animal is wild horse. So, you domesticate and you contain him and now he is no longer dangerous. He is in fact your asset and your resource. Now, you can ride the horse. He is a very proud owner because he is domesticated. He is no longer a threat to you. So, I think there is a domestication of Hinduism going on. And this domestication of Hinduism, we can only appreciate if we compare it with the domestication of pagans. So, the fact even with pagans, they took some pagan ideas, some stories, some whatever, you know, 
and they said oh you know we've already had it in christianity it was it is compatible we bring it in and what not so this went through a period of a couple of centuries of internal ferment within christianity there were two camps those who were very purists did not want the pagan stuff and then those who said yeah we can use it and gradually they made the pagan stuff more and more bible sent bible friendly bible compliant by distorting it little bit what fit they would keep bringing in what would not fit they would destroy so they had to destroy the pagan temples they had to destroy their goddesses their their priests the priestesses they had to destroy a lot that didn't fit so my worry is whether this experiment will result in hinduizing christianity and hinduizing jesus or whether they will take what they need to become stronger and reject what will not fit and in fact we will be in the uh, stomach of the church like the pagans and will there be a day when there, diwali is not linked with any hindu itihas but it is called the festival of lights and jesus also talked about light over darkness and jesus was also talking about diwali only the indians have a different name for it and they'll find some obscure reference in the in the bible where he lit a lamp or something and they'll say diwali is the same thing so it'll be a way to appropriate the symbols the the whatever fit will be taken and whatever doesn't fit will be considered okay this is dangerous this is a poison pill we can't swallow that so maybe reincarnation has to be rejected maybe maybe i don't know so maybe certain aspects have to be rejected because now the church will be dismantled if you accept them the church will be dismantled so my contention is that christianity is a digestion engine started by the romans not started at the time of jesus digestion engine which in the name of imperialism and conquest takes whatever alien things it forms finds and starts gradually digesting what can be useful and like the tiger when he's finished eating the deer he becomes more strong the tiger does not become a docile deer the tiger does not become very nice benign oh my god i'm this little i lick your face and all that deer the dna of the tiger is not compromised okay the deer the dna of the tiger he just eats the deer becomes strong now you can't say the deer has done him a favor because the deer deer has disappeared there is no more deer left it's a pile of you know waste that he has the tiger excretes what he can't digest so whatever they could not digest from the pagans they excreted and destroyed that was waste bad stuff throw it away hinduism similarly is being digested very slowly and hindus need to learn whether, and they need to understand do we want to be food for digestion to create a tr stronger tiger or do we want to say hell no the problem with the tiger is some dna he is violent that is a problem so if you want to complete if you want to really challenge christianity the old guard the church and the authority then you have to really face certain things first they should stop all conversions any any templeton attempt i have made to when they say oh there is no religion we only spirituality then i've said okay issue a statement against all conversions the export of evangelism to convert people in the third world is causing violence is causing tension you should issue a templeton foundation statement that we don't like it they refuse to do that they refuse to do that so they're talking from both sides of the mouth i mean there's so many jesuits i know who in the interest of hindu christian relations and uh, learning uh, all they can about meditation and what not they are very hindu friendly the moment you say i want you to issue a statement against conversions they will not do that okay Th then then you ask them some tough questions about like reincarnation they don't want to go too far because if you bring in reincarnation then the idea of a physical absolute heaven hell eternal damnation all that gets questioned and if all that gets questioned then what are you being saved from you can just do meditation and you can transform yourself if you were really being saved from your ego then you do not need a church so you have to dismantle conversions you have to dismantle this whole heaven hell fear 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 you have to dismantle the power structure of the church now that is a not going to happen that's not going to happen so i just want to ask you where what is your thought on my thesis that this whole movement of bringing in vedanta and spirituality and is going to is really playing into the hands of the power structure of which templeton foundation is a top 
they are they are really know what they're doing i mean they are they are reinventing christianity which has every time christianity digested a civilization it became reinvented and more powerful so yeah. in the in the in the in the renaissance period uh, they they redigested uh, greek thought which earlier they rejected because they want the uh, greeks were pagan they rejected all that but to create the scientific revolution they had to bring in rationality they had to bring in logic philosophy so a lot of this greek inspired thought came and created the renaissance but nobody talks about socrates religion or plato's religion because that's full of uh, things that are against idolatry you know they are all pagans so the, those are they are they are selective in what they want and digest and how to interpret and reinterpret and relocate it as an ornament in their own crown so hinduism and a few of the hindu ideas symbols holidays maybe will be, be embellishing the crown of christianity and hinduism itself will be dead so what is your thought on that <laughs> well as you i'm sure already have either said already but it's obvious that christianity is the most organized religion of all religions yes and particularly the catholic church yes. even more so than yes. any other any other group of christian and the very for example if you wish to say oh i want to invite somebody who represents christianity yes well you could say okay if the pope agrees but supposing we have the same question about hinduism we want to ask somebody who represents hinduism who do we invite because it's not so organized right so in a way as an organization it's almost the very nature of the organization that it wants to protect itself wants to project itself want to make it stronger so in a way everything you are saying that the church will somehow find ways even to take something which is critical of it or is against its usual doctrine would but it will find ways of somehow swallowing it or digesting it i think that is true but my own impression is that really to some extent this kind of enterprise is now the church doing it but throughout human history there have been organizations or powerful people kings etc who just manipulate the people and really any serious searchers are always very few i keep reminding my christian friends probably 100000 people heard christ in jerusalem how many followed him maybe a dozen and a half this is always the case to some extent really at a i know the sort of enterprise that particularly interests you to show how the church has been just kind of swallowing for example many things coming from india particularly in the whole field of consciousness or yoga many wonderful remarks of the buddha many things and that how people just take them on and claim them to be their own i think it's very good what you're doing to point all this out but my own if you like i'm rather to some extent really persuaded looking at the human history including what goes on in india by the way we should not imagine that hinduism is also wonderful what goes on in any of these temples etc is amazes me and how many of our gurus get occasionally caught for their sexual enterprises all this goes on everywhere so my own personal feeling is that although if one is interested in pointing out the kind of misuse of the vedantic information or consciousness great insights from india yeah it's wonderful to point this out but i am very sadly of the opinion this will always go on i think very few people are really interested in searching for the truth and how many people anywhere have even the luxury like you and i have 
to spend time on thinking about these things. Vast majority of human beings are occupied with survival. So, you know, so Ravi, while acknowledging Hinduism has bad gurus and bad problems and what not, all the kind of issues going on like church has, and I am not going there. I am talking about a theological enterprise with lot of money and power, much of it uh, appropriated by conquering other civilizations. After all, the Americas were not uh, a kind of a peaceful mission uh, to win over the Americas and similarly Africa. And in fact, if you go back, even Europe was a conquest by the Euro uh, Romans. Romans were the Christians, they conquered pagan Europe. So, this whole business of conquering one continent after another, becoming strong, becoming powerful, you cannot say that uh, uh, some guru problem somewhere here, there, there is of similar stature because whatever individual, you know, uh, flaws there are, whatever uh, uh, such uh, things go on, uh, it is not of the same stature as world conquest. It is not of the same stature as in terms of shaping human history. It may, it may have localized consequences and if it is a crime, it ought to be prosecuted. There is no doubt about that. But you cannot say that a transgression by individuals, uh, no matter how often it may happen, is of the same stature as a world conquest of civilization after civilization, continent after continent. So, I think that, that the, the digestion problems created in Christianity are a unique phenomena in world history. Uh, yeah. only, only, strong, only two religions, Christianity and Islam, have been so aggressive on a world stage because God mandated they have to do it. And only when you are so aggressively expansionist do you come up with strategies of defeat, destruction and digestion. So, lot of uh, Islam also is digestion. I do, I'm not going there, but I, I'm also going to have discussion with Islamic theologians on the story of Islam as a story of destruction and, and uh, digestion for the sake of expansion. Now, the destruction part of Christianity is well documented. I don't need to uh, repeat because I, I, be repeat, I will not be doing anything original. I want to do something original and say that the destruction of Christianity, destruction by Christianity is one part of the story. The digestion is actually a more interesting part because the digestion is disguised. The digestion is not so clear. The digestion is, comes under the ambiguity that I am here to help you. I am actually helping you by taking Vedanta and appreciating it. And I am helping you by yeah. taking a, one of your brilliant guys, Ravi Ravindra and making him my advisor and he will teach us. He is going to teach us what we don't know, sir. Sir, Ravi Ravindra is, knows more. You guys are so great. He will teach us about the greatness of Vedanta. It comes under that facade. It comes under the facade of actually friendship, Sam, Dan, that kind of a stuff. In, in the end, it is Bhed and Dand. Sam, Dan, Bhed and Dand. Sam is we are all one. <laughs> Dan is I am charitable. That is the good yes. cop. Then the bad yes. cop is Bhed, the difference, what I will not accept, what I will reject, what is your problem, why, why you are not equal to me. That is Bhed and Dand is attack. Okay, I will finish you off. So, this the Samadhan part is this whole nice, you know, Vedanta, Jesus was yogi and all this kind of stuff. Internally, they argue whether to accept or not accept each part of your interpretation, separate from all the other inter parts of your interpretation. Each one part of your interpretation separately goes through a lot of internal churning within Christians on those who want it, those who don't want it. Some will write to you saying this is bad. Some will write to you saying it's great. I had tears in my eyes and all that stuff. And this is a process of multiple generations that they go through. They are very good at it and they are long term thinkers. So, I am saying that the digestion of other civilizations into the belly of Christianity is a topic of very special interest has not been studied before. I am treading some new grounds by creating this theory and I am saying that the next frontier is Hinduism in the digestion machinery. That is mm -hmm. my and I, I understand your view that uh, there were some sporadic mystics also in Christianity of course uh, that uh, uh, the church is a power structure but there are a lot of power structures you know a lot of corporate people are also doing it in multinationals. I understand that and I understand that many Hindu gurus also got their own problems with transgression of their own ethics and so on. I understand that and all those things need to be studied and in fact, there are people who study them. What has not yet been studied adequately is the digestion engine. Christianity as a digestion engine 
and I think that's something big to study. And I'm writing actually many books, not one no, book. That's good. I think it's. I am a great admirer of really what, especially I listened to that talk you gave in the, sponsored by the Indian Embassy, on how various ideas in, especially in the consciousness studies or really the mind studies, basically, how they have been used. And sometimes gradually they forget giving credit for that. No, I, I am a great admirer of this. I have really, I think somebody needs to do it. Personally, I have very strongly the impression that the problem is largely actually is with people in India. Yes. Because in India, I agree. traditionally, yes. search for truth has not separated spiritual truth from whatever we might call scientific truth. Yes. And therefore, everything then spiritual gets called religious and then it doesn't fit into our secular society. Yes. Mm? Especially since Jawaharlal Nehru's almost obsession with secularism. So therefore, anything which is classically coming from India, of necessity, it has a spiritual aspect to it. Because in a way, this is the fundamental distinction from science. Modern science believes that matter is the primary reality. None of the spiritual traditions, and nobody believes that matter is the primary reality. It begins from the highest level of consciousness yes. rather than from the lowest level of consciousness. Right. So right away it becomes spiritual. Right. Just by definition, we may not use the word spiritual, so my own impression is, Rajiv, that what we really need to do seriously, I'm not saying that what you're doing is anything wrong. I'm a great admirer of it. But the real problem is in India. None of our embassies would promote anything of classical Indian search for truth because it is spiritual, it is religious, it is therefore Hindu. Yeah. No, that is that is a battle I, I'm very aware of and I'm very much uh, concerned about it and I'm spending a lot of my time and resources fighting that battle with the Indian government. Even the new Indian government, they have not yet f uh, changed in the in the way they should. But I want to ask you this, if, if the Templeton Christianity prevails and there is this Vedantic Hinduized Jesus becomes a norm, then on what basis would you would they support the exclusivity of Christ? Because you see, if they don't have the exclusivity of Christ, he just becomes one mascot. He just becomes one yogi, maybe one avatar. But then there also are people who are going to do Devi worship and Shiva worship and, and, and Krishna worship. So, but that will not be acceptable to the church. The non-exclusivity of Christ as a path is not acceptable to the church. So, uh, in one sense, uh, the, the Christian world is heading towards another internal, internal clash, a kind of a clash of civilizations within Christianity. It's not with Islam or anybody. Having digested partially enough Vedant creates a kind of an awakening of people, people like you. And uh, so now the, but now the exclusivity of Christ has to be defended. Otherwise, how are you going to go around selling that you got to convert? How can they go to a Hindu village? Uh, and say you should convert to Christianity, otherwise you're doomed to hell. How can they do that when they are taking so much knowledge and resource from the same Hindu tradition? Because with one hand, they are taking knowledge from the Hindu tradition. With the other hand, they're going and saying they're condemning them and, what, and putting pressure on them to convert. This is kind of hypocrisy. This is the two faces. And so one of the things I'm also doing, and I need your help in this, is to bring these two faces of Christianity into loggerheads. We need to we need to put them on the table and say, okay, you say I'm going to hell, and uh, you I better convert, and you got a big machinery in all over India doing that, and you the other Christian is saying that you want to you want Vedanta, there should be no religious difference, and we, Jesus was a yogi and all that. Could you please talk to each other? Because I think there is a there is a Christian versus Christian tension also, and we need to bring that out. Yeah, that is actually, as you know, which is one of the reasons why within Christianity, they occasionally excommunicate somebody or the other or put them more or less on the side. Matthew Fox is a good example. Yes. Thomas Berry is a good example. Yes. There are 
there are others who, for example, Houston Smith might in a way, of course, still say that he's a Christian, but he's a very different kind of Christian. Right. He's not converting anybody. Hmm? Similarly, um, several other people. So to some extent, I think what is happening, you're quite right that within Christianity it is going to create a, a tension or a crisis. But my impression is that the church is actually very clever. You see, after all, all the Jesuits, this is their mission. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're not searching for any spiritual ah, truth. You, you, got, you got it. it. You got it. Yes. <laughs> they're, what they're searching for is how can they promote the doctrine of the church. The, 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 and the, the exclusivity of Christ, the exclusivity of Jesus, that Jesus is not, it's not possible to replace, substitute him with any other icon, any other deity. That is at the center of the whole world of, the whole clash of civilizations. That, that to me is so central. And to me that, yeah. as, a, as yeah. a Hindu, that is non-negotiable. That, okay, you can say yeah. Jesus is great and he's a yogi, this, that, that. But I'm going to keep putting back on the table that I want him to be non-exclusive because I want to worship my Shiva or my Krishna or my Devi, Goddess, whatever I want to do. And I don't, I respect yes. Jesus if you respect my deity. It should be reciprocal. Yes. I, I can tell you one, one of the ways they might go about it. They might even acknowledge that people who are needing a different language or they're not yet developed enough they may have to worship something else. That's probably okay at this stage of their development. <laughs> so this is the this is this is Panikar's thesis. This is the Panikar thesis. You know the Panikar, Raymond Panikar. Yes. Uh, this was yes. his thesis that uh, Jesus is the fulfillment of the Vedas. So Vedas are good, valid. Hinduism is good and valid. It's like you are going from kindergarten through high school. But you want to get to right. be a uh, top guy, you've got to go to grad school and that requires Jesus. Yes. So, so yes. all those are early level. So it's also called uh, uh, like McDonald's lo uh, localization of the hamburger. You localize it. So in India, it is paneer, paneer burger and maybe in China, mm. it is chow mein burger. So you localize this under the umbrella of an institution of McDonald's. So, and you know, Coca-Cola goes and maybe they have mango juice in India or something, whatever they bottle. So, Christianity must localize and Hinduism can become a localized version of Christianity. This is a th very powerful thesis that they have developed over the last 40 years. They've taken your ideas into, Christ that is the global Christianity. There is global Christianity. That is the term that uh, Panikar uses and all these people use. And then there is a localized Christianity which is good for catching these people through their localized version. So you let them call it Hinduism also, but keep telling them about Christ. But ultimately, when the guy's advanced enough, you got to bring him up. So this idea of uh, an imperialism, like uh, Rome had this imperialism, you let local rulers rule, they can continue using their language and whatever. But at some point, you have to, the, at the top level, the power is with the uh, uh, Roman imperial. So this business of the church being the church being the global multinational and various subsidiaries in various countries uh, will be local friendly. They will be inculturation friendly. Uh, they will use uh, bhakti ideas. They will sit on the floor. Jesus will be sitting cross leg. Mother Mary will have a bindi. She will be wearing a sari and they will do puja with the agarbatti and all that. All this facade is going on because it is part of this global local uh, two level strategy. Yes, but I have another suggestion okay. for you. In fact, I have a hint of it in the very book that you started with, the Christ the Yogi, in the introduction. I think this is where we need, if you like, some scholars from India or anywhere else who will actually point out that this notion of the church of focusing on the historicity of Christ is not part of the Christian, real Christian tradition. For example, you may have read that. I quoted one of the great Christian mystics from the 17th century, Angelus Silesius. This is what he said. It's actually in that book, in the introduction, you can read that. Christ may be born a thousand times in Galilee, all in vain, unless he's born in me. Now, you see, if the 
Hindu scholars can actually take on trying to show that Christian doctrine was actually at their best trying to come to some understanding of what Vedanta has been saying. Or what, for example, our great scholar Shankara, you know, when somebody sees directly, then the scripture ceases to be authoritative. Nobody in the Abrahamic tradition could possibly say that. So, so what I'm saying is, we need to, we need to actually, if you're serious about it, you need to find the scholars who would actually point out that the serious aspect of Christianity is trying to come to the great understanding of the Indian tradition, but in the process it gets lost. So, so we need to start coming. So I back. wrote a book called Being Different. I'll send you a copy of that. Uh, one of the centerpieces, and I, I'm showing you, showing how the difference are between Dharma tradition and Abrahamic tradition. That's the book, whole book. And there are four or five non-negotiable differences which you can't reconcile. So one of them is this whole idea of history centrism. I coined the term history centrism to define what is historically necessary condition, absolutely historical truths, historical facts that are non-negotiable, that are absolutes, that are non-verifiable, and they are necessary conditions for the system to be valid. I'm calling that history centrism, that idea. And I'm discussing that versus what I call Adhyatma Vidya, the Rishi tradition that everybody can have this experience and what not. So what you are pointing out, this tension I've discussed in a lot of times and a huge, the large, probably one of the largest chapters on this book, this whole idea, this Adhyatma yogic kind of a path versus the history centric path. So I'm very familiar with this. I've done a lot of research on this. Now, the idea of Christianity accepting it is up to up to Christians to do. It's not something that Hindus can tell them. They already know. But whether they accept this or not is not for us to uh, worry about. It's their choice. Now, this business that... No, Raji, let me say something yeah. here, which is important. Christian church may not accept it at present, but many, many educated people in the Western world are actually beginning to move towards yes. that. I have, I in fact was just hardly a month ago invited in England at two different places to give talks. One was a conference on called Mystics and Scientists. The other one is Temenos Academy. And both places I tried to point this out that in my experience in the last 20 years, even when there is an increased interest in different levels of consciousness, etc. No Western scholar ever refers to anything in the Bible. They would refer to something in yoga or something in Buddhism. I seem to be the only scholar who actually happily will quote something from the Bible or from St. Paul. And in a way, Rupert Sheldrake was actually chairing one of these sessions. He thanked me afterwards by trying to point out that they do have a spiritual tradition. This is Rupert Sheldrake actually saying that to me at the end of this conference. Now, the reason I'm saying that is that even though the church may not so easily move over, but educated, intelligent people in the Western world who have, a, if you like, Christian background, they are moving over. Just hardly a week ago, I was in Colombia, another conference. Nominally, they are all Roman Catholics but they have no interest in what the Catholic Church has to say. They are much more interested in what yoga has to say or what Buddhism has so, to say. So, this has been part of the digestion process. To digest, the tiger has to appreciate the deer he's going to eat. He cannot say, I hate this deer. After all, this deer is dinner. So, I have to love this deer. So, going and loving the yoga, bringing yogis, explaining to them is has been part of the digestion process. So that is not, uh, so we can't say that uh, the, the question is the following. Let me ask you a different question. The Christ has to be discovered in me. So here, here you have to stop and say, I discover Ma Kali in me. Is that okay? You have to tell, tell him that. You have to tell him that. Uh, because the idea of Christ is again history centric. It is that particular Christ who was born, who died, who did this, do that. So, as long as that's the Christ I have to discover in me, we have not, uh, we have not gained anything. So, there is a no, big but movement. The point there I is, make to is this, that the so-called church authorities may not accept that.
but you can go to any yoga community. I often go to them because of my, I made a new translation of the Yoga Sutras and of the Bhagavad Gita. My Bhagavad Gita book has just come out hardly two weeks ago. And, and then a commentary on it. And therefore, for example, the European Yoga Union for their 40th anniversary invited me to be the chief guest in Switzerland. And they have already now invited me again for their 45th anniversary. The reason I'm saying all that is not to promote myself, but more to say that in the yoga community, I find they don't give a damn what the church has to say. They are actually, so you may be right that the church officials, even the Jesuits are trying to digest this deer. But what I'm saying is on the other hand, many of the people who used to go to the church or their parents used to go to the church, no longer bother to go to the church. Okay. They don't I, care what no, the no. church has to say. We, we, I know. Are you familiar with a movement called Christian Yoga? Not very familiar, but a little bit. Okay. So, so the fastest growing yoga system in the United States is Christian Yoga. Uh, the the other yoga is spiritual. There used to be Hindu yoga in the 60s. It was no nonsense Hindu yoga. They had Hindu deities. They would they would do all that. Then Hinduism. Yeah. Uh, then it branched into two kinds. One became science and health only, totally secularized. That is the YMCA yoga. And then the other yoga mm -hmm. became spiritual but not religious. So they decontextualized the Hinduism without recontextualizing it as Christianity. So this decontextualized everything spiritual kind of yoga is probably the group that you are addressing. They like Bhagavad Gita, but Bhagavad Gita in a very particular interpretation and Patanjali Yoga Sutra is also because I go to these people as part of my research. I've been doing that on a regular basis. Now this spiritual but not religious yoga then goes further to the next stage of digestion and becomes Christian yoga. So now Christian Yoga, I just interviewed, you should go to my website, I interviewed one lady who runs one of 25 different big Christian Yoga institutions. Her group alone has 2000 teachers of Christian Yoga certified by them and they are planning, they are expecting to train another 800 by the end of this year. This army of 2800 yoga teachers around the world, part of one system setting up their own centers, their own practices, going to schools, teaching in churches is bigger than Baba Ramdev's army, bigger than Bihar School of Yoga, bigger than Sri Sri Yavi Shankar, bigger than yoga being taught by Ramakrishna Mission. There is no Hindu organization that can match the scale, the, 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 the strategy. Uh, and they are also into, uh, you know, you do Namaste to discover the Christ in you. But they are very careful that it can only be the Christ in you and, and that is why you have to keep repeating those verses to make sure you don't fall away. That they will tell you. And the silence, <laughs> the silence is a place where the devil may enter or some false god may enter or some idolatry may enter. So to prevent the silence from bringing all those, you have to continue chanting the, the verses from the Bible which they tell you what they are. So this business that you have to have Christ born in you is child's play. It is a bacha, it's a child level thing. It is basically Christ as in the Bible. So the, the fact that I will bring Christ in me, that I'll merge with Christ, I will, I will uh, do namaskar to Christ, uh, Christ is my guru. So they have a lesson on do we believe in guru? And they say we only believe in guru if it is Christ but nothing else. Do we believe in namaskar? We believe in namaskar if it is Christ. Do we believe in mantra? Yes, but mantra has to be interpreted a certain way. There is somebody, there is a young man, Indian man called Russell Paul. He's a, he's a young, he's a follower of Bede Griffiths. And he is somewhere in Texas. He believes in Raga. He believes in teaching Sanskrit. Uh, he believes in uh, all the yoga. Uh, he believes in all of that stuff. Uh, he believes in, the, you know, the ideas, the symbolism. But everything has been reinterpreted to be Christian. So it is, it is, to me, it is not a sign of, okay, now there's all these progressive people and we should be very happy and all that. This is just an, a, a sophisticated stage of digestion. And so, uh, so that's my, I keep coming back to it because I've, I've been there. I've talked to all these people. There are certain boundaries they will not cross. One is bringing a non-Christian deity into the church. No, 
Whenever I go to the Unitarian church near my house, they talk like exactly like you, that we think everything is all harmony, uni, you know, universal truth, truth is one, spiritual. I tell them, okay, great. Tomorrow, I'm going to bring a Hindu uh, priest and we are going to install Kali in your temple. And they say, hell no. Hell no, you can't do that. <laughs> and I say, I'm going to. So, you see, the, I, certain philosophical metaphysics about the nature of the self, which, which says the Jeevatma reincarnates. Uh, the the, the yeah. access through Nam, the access, the ultimate is transcendent beyond Nam Roop, but Nam Roop is available as an access method. That is how the whole whole worship is. That there is a Nam Roop method, method. I can have the deity of my choice. That is the Ishta Devata. These are not yeah. available. They are not allowed. So these are I call them poison pills. Poison pill yeah. is something. If the deer has poison pill. Then if the tiger swallows him, the tiger will die. So the yes. tiger is very smart. He either if he's foolish, he'll take it and he'll die. But if he is smart, he will understand there is a poison pill and he will not eat, he will leave that guy alone. Uh, so I give the example of a porcupine. So porcupine is very docile and humble guy. He is not aggressive, but he pulls out his quills and he says, okay, you can digest me. But of course, the tiger goes running around trying to find a way to catch him. But he knows that if he digests this guy, the quills will go in and kill him. So, he, it becomes non-digestible. So, I, my, my idea is that Hinduism needs to have poison pills which are not to be separated such that if you want, you can digest but you got to take the poison pill also as part of the digestion. Yeah. So, one, one poison pill is deity. We have to say, okay, you want a yoga center, let's put the deity. Another, and you can put Jesus also. Uh, they will not allow. Another, an, another is reincarnation. And there are about five or six of these uh, poison pills that I am developing. I want your idea about, uh, can, you, can you market the poison pills to Templeton? <laughs> no, but what I am saying is, did they accept your poison pills? They, the foolish people do. And I, there are quite a lot of those. Uh, for example, it's fashionable to accept reincarnation by about 20% of the Christians accept reincarnation in the pop culture. Uh, you know, because I like this dog, very loving dog, maybe he was my child in the previous life, it's not that sort of thing. But they haven't thought through theologically what's the implication of doing that. Uh, 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 yes. If you talk to a serious theologian, he will raise issues about either he will reinterpret this reincarnation in such a strange way that it's not the same thing or he has to end up rejecting it. So, I would say that there is a naive Christian, the pop culture Christian, uh, the new age Christian, the spiritual but not religious Christian who are willing to accept all these kind of things, but they are muddled up and that's not a stable long term state for those people. They go through a stage in life where like that, but towards the later stage of their life, they go back. They go back to, they, that I call that the U-turn. They go back and U-turn. Lot of those people, they U-turn. So, in a in a certain stage in their life, they're having fun with you, and they are very happy, and you are great. You're giving them this idea and all that. But that is a stage where our gurus and people like you need to push them over the line. You need to push them over the line, and that's the that's the why you are such a fascinating guest because I think you are the right guy to push them over the line, and I'd like to work with you on that. Are you willing? You see, for example, they can actually sooner or later incorporate reincarnation okay. because there was for for a long time reincarnation was not excluded from Christianity. It actually happened only in the sixth century, and then Oregon, one of the early church fathers, Greek church father, very much believed in reincarnation. Yes, he did. But then he was declared a heretic. But that happened only in the 6th But you see, when the digestion happens, after a while, they are the, the, the enzymes in the stomach, the enzymes in the stomach are breaking down the food. And when they break down the food, they know what has to be excreted because this is no good. And what can be digested. So, Oregon brought it in. I know, and some people say that he was influenced by Indian thought only. Some people say that Oregon travel to India and what not, what not, we don't know. Uh, they, he kept putting this poison pill in, but the Christianity processed it for a while. There were multiple camps, like right now people are arguing for and against Vedanta, for and against Yogi, uh, Jesus as Yogi and all of that stuff, 
which is what you are in the middle of. But at the end of the day, the, when the, uh, uh, of, uh, as far as Oregon's reincarnation is concerned, they excreted it as waste, as something that has to be toxic and thrown out. So, because the integrity, what is the DNA, you have to understand, is not quest for truth. The DNA is power of an institution. That is what it is. And, and you, have acknowledged, you have said it yourself that that institution is the world's most powerful institution. And until you are willing to take up and say, okay, this has to be disbanded. And until Templeton Foundation is willing to say, okay, let's disband the church. Let's disband the church and have something called scientific spirituality with no brand name for Jesus Christ. We don't need a mascot. Jesus as mascot should go. We don't need that. We just have without Nam Roop or all the Nam Roops allowed. Either they should, they should say either all the Nam Roops are allowed, all the deities or none. And we can have Nirakar. And so they have to take, somebody has to take that step against the might of the established church. Until they do that, I don't think I'm willing to buy that, oh, you know, things have changed. Because it's just a facade. But you see, for example, the business of reincarnation, to take a particular example, there is going to be, already is, a fair amount of scientific yes. data being yes. gathered. Especially this character, Ian Stevenson, yes. who was at Maryland University. He's passed away now for several years, but he has written many books and he's not the only one. So what I'm saying is that out of the, you mentioned two things, especially um, introducing some other deities other than Christ and also the idea of reincarnation. I think science will come to your aid. Yes. Yes. More and yes. more. So it doesn't have to be only a matter of belief yes. uh, that we just accept this. Yes. That so then the question of other deities, that is not something that science can really do anything about. On the other hand, if one can have my own impression, really, Rajiv, I say that in many different ways. The reason I very much admire your own work is what you need is really a whole team of people. In fact, not only one team, you need several centers in India doing serious research of precisely the kind you're trying yes. to do. And unfortunately, the government of India will not support Yes. You because we are secular. Yes. Yes. I mean, but maybe the present government might. Actually, on the other hand, they have the other danger of becoming so fanatic you know, Hindutva, this or that, without trying to study something. I'm, for example, really struck. They keep talking about the Bhagavad Gita, making it the national book. Very few of them have actually read the Bhagavad Gita carefully. This is a tragedy. So, so let, me, let, me, let me get back on your point about deities. deities. So, the scientific approach to studying deities. Uh, we have something called Agama. Agama which has not been studied enough and needs to be studied. Agama is, uh, the claim of Agama uh, is that these are the processes, these are the processes of mantra, these are the processes of rituals, these are the processes of doing the yagna, of getting married, of doing the puja, and that they all have a scientific efficacy. And this is a neurological science. This is a neurological science that is there, is there a neurological correlate with a particular deity uh, being invoked and be a certain agama process being done in a certain way, such that this has a neurological, pro uh, some neurological activation, which is kind of micro macro connected with other persons, maybe other living entities, which may be quantum entangled with some of these other entities, which may be quantum entangled with cosmos and macro things happening. So, what is the efficacy of agama on on individual neurology, collective neurology, cosmic neuro, there is no neurology but a cosmic consciousness, the, this kind of a uh, research needs to be done because I feel we cannot debunk the uh, ritual as something conventional, as something called arbitrary and voodoo and all that because uh, these have to be put under a control test and things have to be tested out. I have seen, I have seen some extraordinary accomplishments. I don't want to go into those now because that's a whole discussion by itself. 
extraordinary accomplishments that science needs to come and investigate based on these arguments. I have seen that. So as a scientist, I cannot just dismiss it. I mean, I have to, all I can say is that this needs to be investigated further. And I just had a very good uh, conversation with, uh, a professor, uh, with Dr. Ramachandran, V. Ramachandran, the famous neuroscientist in San Diego. Uh, we have not uh, uh, loaded it up yet, uh, where we are talking about these issues. And he says he's interested in going to India. I'll take him to these places and put them through a very rigorous empirical test, uh, scientific test on the efficacies of some of these Agama claims. I think we need to do that. So this is a, so to me, there is a possibility that there is some consciousness, uh, scientific consciousness process that has to do with these deities. And we cannot just say that they have to be rejected. Yeah, there is a, I'm sure when serious research is going to be done in this area, this issue will come up because we see in many of these, for example, so-called near-death experiences yes. or that people, if they come from a Buddhist background, they encounter people like the Bodhisattvas, Bodhisattvas. Right. But if they come from a Christian background, they might meet a Christian saint or might even meet Christ in this altered state of consciousness. So to some extent, this issue will have to be there because increasingly now it is clear that if I grow up listening to say Chinese music rather than Indian music, my brain structure becomes different. So many of these Agama practices may have much to do with that, that there is a certain mindset that, because even the DNA can be now influenced by environmental conditions. Yeah, the epigenetics. This is actually more and more the research. Epi, the epigenetics, that's the epigenetics. Yeah. So, so what I'm saying is that in a way, this area needs to be investigated more. I would agree yeah. with you. So then, of course, People who have been brought up in the Christian background would naturally, they would encounter a picture of Christ or some image of Christ in afterlife or post near death experiences are more and more being studied. But we could, we, we, we could, near we could death, also, nearing yeah. death. we could also find out that maybe this is conditioning. Maybe the person has a, has a condition, he, he's expecting. It's wishful thinking. He wants yeah. to see Christ. And this wishful thinking is being projected into a state which is not quite uh, far along, but it, he's just gone into death up to a point. And in that point, he's still yes. carrying the baggage of conditioning. He's still carrying his That's sanskars. Right. And his sanskars may be from one religion, another religion. Some guy will see that he's become a billionaire. He's won the lottery. Uh, some guy may see that, uh, yeah. you know, uh, his company has become the biggest company in the world. So whatever is his unfulfilled fantasy, maybe he sees that. So I think the research has to be done because I'm talking about Agama, which is not just sort of a, a trance. I'm not talking about evaluating what happened, what you see in a trance. But what are the manifested, empirically provable things that uh, can happen? For instance, for instance, third eye awakening. Third eye awakening where your cognition is not only limited to light coming through these eyes. Now, the, now I, it's a very interesting, I have eye problem. I went to a local, very famous doctor. He's got nothing to do with any spirituality. He's just a very good eye doctor. Uh, actually, he's of Chinese origin, brilliant man. And he told me, he said, your brain can is constructing the image out of lot of inputs, not only limited to what you're getting from your eyes. So he says that a lot of blind people, they build a kind of a map of their terrain and they're able to move quite effectively. And it is not, it is not conventional medical science does not understand how it works, but they're very open to it and they're investigating. So I think there are other senses than the senses that we are told about. And so there's yes. a large amount of research which will expand the domain of consciousness science by quite a lot and further challenge the dogma approach. But what, what my hope is that maybe you will be able to persuade, we in India need to be doing this kind of yes. research. We don't need to be relying on people coming from the Christian background doing right. this. I agree with that. Why should we be right. doing it? Now, now, one thing I want to tell you before, before I close, um, that very interesting 
meeting where I was invited by Templeton Foundation in the Hyatt Regency uh, in the late 90s probably sometime when your book had just come out. Uh, it's very interesting that Herb Benson was there and he had come back from India. Herb Ooh. Benson. See, see the again. Herb Benson. Oh, the okay. Harvard guy. The guy who created yeah. the relaxation response. Uh, took the transcendental meditation, made it into relaxation response. Famous guy. Mm -hmm. And he, he was asked, what is the science in uh, India, in the Hin Indian traditions? And he mockingly said there's only two things he found. One was the urine therapy and the other was astrology. And they all laughed. And, and I made a rebuttal and, deci and decided that this is not the, the place I want to belong to. I just want you to know that. But it's very interesting. Infinity Foundation gave a grant to Jennifer Morgan to develop a course on how to teach science in the schools. And this was basically a whole Hindu idea. The Brahman being manifested, Brahman's manifestation as how science starts. I mean, the, the study of science is a study of Brahman's manifestation. The Sagun Brahman, we are trying to understand Sagun Brahman, how he works. So, it's very interesting that Templeton was giving her an award in that. Uh, and when I pointed out that this is great, I'm so happy because we gave this grant. Uh, she felt a little awkward because she had not quite acknowledged to them that this was actually a Hindu idea. So, some of these Hindu ideas, these guys get awards also. And then there is a, a rejection or a recoiling when this becomes known that this is this is Hinduism inside, in a, in a sense. <laughs> yeah. So I, I uh, uh, and, and I've had a lot of uh, uh, a lot of encounters, a lot of uh, uh, you know good and bad with Temple and Foundation. I think they are doing good work also. They are doing good work. I certainly acknowledge that. But I feel also that they have had a tendency to be sort of the big brother that sucks everything into a certain paradigm, you know, a certain framework. And beyond a certain, like for instance, they will not do Agama research. If we want to do Agama research on Devi Puja, and we want to do yes. an investigation on Tantra, that's not something of interest to them. And we want to do it without compromising the integrity of the traditional system and the traditional vocabulary and the Devi Puja, the whole whole bhakti that goes with it. We don't want to compromise that and turn it into some clean thing that they can appreciate. We want to bring all of that symbolism, everything in it. Those are the sort of things that people need to do, to be honest, to really be honest. And you are right, it is a job of the Indian government to do it. You are also right that they are not doing it. And I am trying my best and we will see what happens. No, this is, I actually very much admire this whole effort. And maybe sooner or later it will change. India unfortunately still many people in India really have a kind of a colonial attitude. If something is approved in the Western world, then we, even if it comes from India, then we can admire it. Otherwise, we don't admire it. But I think this is where somebody like Aurobindo was really remarkable, yes. I feel. Um, more than almost anybody else in the 20th century, Aurobindo was not unfamiliar with the Western world. My goodness, he translated Homer from Greek into English. So, but he brought a very deep Indian perspective. But is there anybody in the, in the Aurobindo ashram or in the generally in the Aurobindo foundation doing any research like this? No. They have all become Wilburites because Ken Wilbur appropriated this and turned it into his own theory. And so all the people who ought to be doing Sri Aurobindo work are actually, uh, you know, m many of them are inclined to follow Wilbur. So this is, I'm writing a book on the whole, how Wilbur hijacked the Sri Aurobindo uh, legacy and, and ideas and, and introduce distortions in order to do, in order to achieve that. So I want to, uh, Ravi, I want to thank you. This has been, I think we should have more of these because there's so much to talk about. And uh, uh, I want to thank you for your time. You are a brilliant man. Uh, you've had a great career. And uh, let not another 20 years go by before we connect. Uh, let's uh, stay in touch. If you are ever in the New Jersey area, do come, spend time with me, spend a few days. We will hang out together and 
and maybe think of how we can put our thoughts together and move these ideas further because maybe with your connections with Templeton Foundation and I'm, I've been since we last talked, I've been doing a lot of work on my own with various other kind of groups in India and maybe we can yes. convince them uh, to become a lot more, uh, uh, you know, a lot more open uh, because they have a lot of money. At the same time, I don't want to uh, access that money if it comes with strings that have to be, you know, like Christian friendly, that kind of a, those strings I don't want. But we can talk about it. Yeah, we should talk. But let me just mention this to you. This book of mine has just come out. Okay. Hardly three weeks ago. Okay. Published by Shambhala Publication. Right. Who are a fairly well-known publisher, as you know. And if you get a chance, I would be very happy to have your comments on it because sure. I feel sometimes to even encourage our researchers in India, we need to focus on some of the classical texts of India. For right. example, the Yoga Sutra right. or the Bhagavad Gita right. or the Upanishad. Right. Right. It's not that people don't write about it, but right. they are not approaching these texts with a very modern mindset. Hmm. I think that is required. Right. That's why I'm really in a way suggesting to you whether it makes sense to you. Have a look at it and then comment. Good. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you Ravi. Namaskar to you. All the best. Yes. Wish you all the best. Good health. And uh, let's stay in touch. Namaskar. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So, I want to analyze. Uh, this, is a, this is a very important uh, discussion. Uh, a lot of, lot is being said between the lines I want to interpret. Ravi Ravindra is probably the, one of the most eminent Hindu, highly trained physicists, philosophers, uh, who knows Christianity inside out better than many Christians do, most Christian theologians do, who has been working on the other side. In other words, his target readers are mostly Westerners. The, the conferences he goes to are Westerners. The people who fund him are Westerners. Now, he's an honest man. They, there are a lot of such people who genuinely believe that they are going to uh, reprogram Christianity and make them Hindus by going inside. And notice when I mention the digestion that he is actually part of helping them digest Hinduism. It's Hinduism he's taking inside. It's not that he's taking poison pills that will transform them and make them Hindu. So the difference between helping them digest us on the one hand and putting in poison pills to change them truly and not have the, not have the same aggression on the other hand. That difference is very important, but he didn't, he didn't have it and uh, you could notice when I discussed digestion, there was a bit of resistance. He wanted to talk about, you know, uh, Swamis are corrupt or they have sex problems or a church is not the only powerful thing. A lot of people are powerful. I mean, those are not relevant arguments. The point is there is digestion going on regardless of all that. And then when I talked about poison pill, that was another new concept that, you look, it's okay to feed them all this stuff, but include the poison pills. That was also not something that, uh, you know, is, has been part of his thinking. And then this idea that you should, one of the poison pills, one of the conditions you should put in is that you should totally reject the whole missionary conversion, evangelism, the global empire building. You should completely reject that because there is no scientific validity. And if you believe that the historicity has to be compromised, the historicity of Jesus has to be toppled, make it a clear statement that either there is no Jesus or he is not necessary or there are many other deities also possible. And in any case, you should not go around converting other people. Make it a part of your explicit extrovert, you know, right in the face position. Make it with infinite, with the Templeton Foundation who is sponsoring you for decades. Make it wherever you go. All these prestigious places want to bring you in. Make it part of that. You see, I am trying to push him beyond the line. Because I think if I am successful in pushing Ravi across that boundary, there is a mental boundary he won't cross. But if I can convince him to go past that boundary, then such a guy could be very useful. But I doubt that they'll keep inviting him. Because I've tried that. I've tried going to all those kind of prestigious places with huge rewards. You can join all kind of advisory boards and do all that. If you keep your mouth shut on poison pills, if you keep your mouth shut on the things that you want them to stop doing, if all you talk about is helping them digest more and more. 
bring them meditation, give them a course. Tell them about Gita and they can pick and choose and create the Gita of Jesus. And take them more Yoga Sutra and all that and they can keep picking here and there. Okay, so now I'm worried that they, as Agamas become more important in, the, in our Renaissance, they will be dissecting the Agamas and Christianizing bit here, bit there and bringing in this particular Yagna to Jesus, that kind of stuff they start doing. So, Ravi is one of the most important persons I could bring to you possibly, who is right in the crossroads of, crossroads of this digestion process. He is sit, sitting right in the middle of the digestion engines, places like Templeton Foundation and Vatican and many other places for many decades of his life and considered a superstar and a brilliant person by the Christian world uh, because he is bringing so much in, uh, intellectual Ma, you know, material to them and he's a dear friend and I think on a personal level he means well but I have to keep reminding him and I've had a gap of almost 20 years now but I have to keep reminding him of the long-term macro effects of what he's doing even with good intentions. So I leave you with that please go back and rewind and look at it again because maybe you'll see it differently the second time and I hope you will. I want to conclude by saying uh, we are happy that some of you have been generous and sent us donations by going to uh, infinityfoundation.com slash donate. We need more of you. We need sustained basis. We really want help because each of these episodes has a huge impact. We are not doing them randomly. These are turning into books. We need editors. We need, you know, we need not only people who do video editing and turn this into a video library. We are then going to turn these into e-learning e courses. That takes resources. We're going to turn them into books. So, and we are cre creating an army of a home team of young scholars in India who are going to take up similar topics and go further. And, and we are doing it through various mechanisms, including holding conferences. All this is a fairly uh, ambitious plan, but we need to do this. Uh, we have started Infinity Foundation India, so we can also accept in rupees. Whether you are able to give us in dollars, we have that. Whether you are willing to give us in rupees, we have the tax exempt status in India also. So we are requesting you to please get involved and help us out in very concrete ways. Thank you for listening. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be able to connect with my followers on a regular basis. I wish you well and, and we'll see you again in a few days. Namaskar.